Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for the access that we have to come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to continue studying your word together, feasting upon it. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, but just seal to our hearts only that which is. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Good morning. This is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation. I'm going to try to add or include with this, along with this video toward the end of it, uh, something that I feel is important when it comes to how to study God's Word. Uh, there are various uh, rules of interpretation. Uh, there are various aspects of, of uh, that subject that may help some of you. Uh, may, some of you may be familiar with these. Some of you may, be not, may not be. But uh, it's just something that the Lord has laid on my heart to address. I'm also going to be reading uh, uh, toward the end of the video uh, something from uh, uh, one of the, the greatest theologians that, that I would I consider one of the greatest of our generation or, or of the, the 19th or the 20th century uh, uh, from the, the 1930s uh, to the, about the 1950s very influential uh, uh, theologian concerning the subject, uh, particularly the subject of, of, of what I believe is extremely important in our understanding of the, the difference between dispensations, uh, law and grace, as well as uh, uh, the, uh, of Israel and the church. Uh, that the church has not uh, replaced Israel. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. But we're in chapter 19. I'm going to continue on there in, in about verse 11, uh, where the text says, And I saw heaven opened, and uh, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. We're looking at the second coming of Christ. Now, there's obviously, and many of you are aware of this, there's many viewpoints on whether or not uh, Christ's second, uh, second coming uh, is, uh, when he comes again, uh, he'll come just once or twice. You know, if, you're, if you hold the, to the pre-tribulational view, uh, uh, as this ministry does, then you understand that there, uh, the teaching of Paul concerning the rapture of the church, that we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And the, so the church is removed before Daniel's 70th week begins, that uh, the church uh, plays no role, has no function, no part in uh, inside Daniel's 70th week. Now, many will argue on uh, against that. Uh, and, and oftentimes they'll bring up the subject of, of Darby. Well, you know, the rapture or the rapture, the word rapture doesn't appear uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, uh, Darby invented the, the, the term and so on and so forth. Uh, the actual truth of that concerning Darby is, is that Darby was, did not introduce uh, some new concept of the rapture, but but all he did was confirm or continue to confirm uh, the fact that there was. He, he helped uh, reinforce that fact. The, the early apostolic fathers believed in the rapture. Uh, uh, Paul certainly believed in the rapture of the church. It's, it's not something new that came about as a result of John Darby. So they're mistaken about that. John says he saw... Uh, heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and of course you know 
there's where I'm tempted to stop and launch into a long, you know, go into a long diatribe about how faithful God is in our lives, uh, as opposed to our uh, often uh, uh, failure uh, to trust God. It's uh, dearly beloved, we are not saved because we are faithful, but because God is faithful and God can be trusted. And the reason he can be trusted is because he cannot lie. Faithful and true. And it's in righteousness. Uh, and again, I could stop there and we could spend some time talking about the righteousness of God. All righteousness is of the Lord. That is a, a very simple, straightforward fact that so many Christians today fail to comprehend. If they only understood that we have no righteousness in and of ourselves, that all righteousness is of the Lord, that the righteousness that we stand in is the righteousness that he imputed unto us, that we were made a new creation in Christ, made a... Uh, a new creation and given a, a new man in which, uh, which cannot sin, that all the old man does is sin. It's it's a very it's a vital it's a crucial fact that we understand the nature and the function and the characteristics of righteousness and how that uh, applies to our lives. Uh, it, it is directly connected to the fact that he's the vine, we're the branches, that we can produce nothing on our own, that it's not our lives serving Christ for others, but Christ serving others through us, that they see him, not us. It's not I, but Christ. Uh, we stand in the righteousness of God. We walk in that righteousness of God. And we rest in that, in that righteousness of God absolutely assured of the fact that God will remain faithful, that he's true, and that he will complete what he began in our lives. And so it's in righteousness he does judge and make war. The time has come. And, you know, if, if you're uh, looking around you today, you know, it, it seems like uh, we're becoming more and more aware of just how uh, corrupt this evil world system is and th there is a uh, there's a great temptation on our part to just you know we just want we want vengeance uh, you know we want to be vindicated uh, there's a seems to be this righteous indignation we take a look around us at, at, and I won't go into all of the aspects of, of the uh, everything that's going on here in the world, but I think if you just take a look around you, you'll see that there's enough going on that uh, we just can't wait for God to come back and judge the wicked. Uh, it is in righteousness that he judges and makes war. Not in unrighteousness. Uh, it's not it's not in the, in the same way that we would we might go about settling a dispute, okay? And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Doesn't the text doesn't say his eyes were a flame of fire? But it says that his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, why does it say that? Why did God the Holy Spirit want to convey the thought in in such terms as that? as a flame of fire. Now, when, when I read that and I, I thought of the eyes, what are the eyes? The eyes is something that we see through. It's, it's where we get our vision. And, of course, fire is always, most always, if not always, uh, in the Bible, fire is, represents judgment. Uh, it's, it's at Bema that our works will be judged, and all of that which is done in the flesh will, will go up in smoke. There is no judgment for the believer in Christ, but here his eyes are as a flame of fire. 
Now, if you can't read that, dearly beloved, and not see that that what that is saying is that it's judgment based on the clear vision of God, clear sight. He sees clearly. Then I, I, I don't know how else that you would interpret that phrase, or I don't know what else that you could say about that. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Uh, we don't tend to, uh, especially nowadays, but our, I, I, I believe it could be said that the world's justice system has always been somewhat blind. Justice is blind. You know, we'll try a case based upon the evidence. Sometimes the evidence may be faulty. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to, uh, to reach a conclusion on that based upon the uh, preponderance of the evidence. And, uh, and uh, someone is often found guilty uh, or not guilty. They've, found, they've been found not guilty uh, based upon a, uh, there, there being a shadow of a doubt. Uh, here, there is no such thing as that. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, many crowns. Well, when I first read that, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, we cast all our crowns at his feet because he's worthy. That he, he did that work through in and through our lives. We didn't do it on our own. The flesh profits nothing. And so we cast our crowns at his feet. And the crowns that we cast at his feet are, the word is Stephanos. It's where you get my name, Stephen, Stephanos. Victor's crowns. Uh, crowns, a uh, wreath uh, crowns. Uh, awarded in uh, to participants of that were vic victorious in the Olympic Games, um, but here the word crowns is uh, diadem. It's royalty. So on his head were many crowns of royalty, not Stephanos, but royalty. Uh, now, I guess I could stop right here and launch off into, take, take a, a rabbit trail off into how important it is to, to at least make some effort to look at the original text, because sometimes in the English, we don't see that distinction. It just says, on his head were many crowns. And we just take in crowns and sort of lump it into one, one category. Uh, there are various words used for crown, uh, diadem and Stephanos being uh, just two. Uh, so that's a lot of crowns. If, if, if you add to the fact that we cast all our crowns at his feet, now of course the text doesn't anywhere, nowhere does it say that he wears those crowns, but we do give those crowns back to him. He's awarded those crowns by us. We cast those crowns at his feet. I think that what we can say, at the very least, what we can say is, is, is about these many royal crowns of royalty, is, is that it is, uh, and the reason that the, word, the text says many, and the way that I read that is, is that the characteristics, the attributes of God are so numerous that he's worthy of all those crowns of royalty. Uh, I personally would consider it odd if the text said that he just wore one crown, one diadem, uh, crown of royalty, because our God is greater than that. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And that has puzzled many, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, you get, you know, for generations. Why does it say that he had, a, and why does the Holy Spirit want us to know that he had a name written that no man knew but he himself? I'm going to take the position that, that obviously, obviously there is more yet to be known of him when we leave here. Uh, it's the only way I can see, I can look at that. 
And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. Now, we just got through reading that in righteousness he does judge and make war. So it's, it's easy to just read that and just think of that as the blood of his enemies. He's judging in righteousness, uh, faithful and true. So he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. The word dipped in the Greek is it's, it's the same word used for uh, the rich man asking uh, God if, if Lazarus could dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. It's the same word used for Jesus dipping the morsel uh, in uh, the whatever it was he dipped it in uh, and giving it to Judas. So, it's, it's, so the word dipped means dipped. Uh, it's closely identified with the word baptized, which is where we get the word identified, of di uh, dyeing a garment by identifying that garment with whatever it is that we dip it into. But it's, uh, it's not completely covered. It's dipped. He's not drenched. He's not, you know, otherwise his garment wouldn't be white. His, his vesture's dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In Isaiah 63, 2, we read, Why are your clothes red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? Uh, if we keep reading to verse 3, it says, And their life blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. Now we know that the blood of Christ was applied to us. That we're covered in the blood of Christ. We are covered in His blood. Isn't it interesting here that, that when God judges the nations, He judges and makes war at the second coming when He returns. Is it not interesting that we actually see a reversal? Uh, his blood was applied to us. Their blood is sprinkled on him. Is is he arrayed in both a vesture dipped in his own blood by which he purchased uh, us, redeemed us, by which he, per he, he, he purchased his power and right to judge as well as the blood of his enemies over whom he always uh, is victorious and uh, over whom he also, you know, prevails. Now, is it both? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. Uh, it's just something for you to think about. Uh, I believe the context, which is extremely important, bears out that we're looking at the justice of God being carried out in the act of judgment, just justice, not vengeance, but God is just. It's not vengeance as, as we would, tip, as humans typically tend to use the word uh, vengeance, you know, payback, you know, it's just. So that's the context. And, but, but it wouldn't surprise me any. If you want to take that as, as including his own blood, uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. I don't have any problem with that. I believe that the the weight of the context bears out that this is referring to the blood of his enemies. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Uh, two words, armies and followed. And we could spend some time talking about who, who are these people or who are these individuals? Are they, are they uh, the good angels, the unfallen, the angels? Uh, accompanied uh, by uh, the saints of God. And if so, if it's both, uh, who are these saints? Are they Old Testament saints? Are they tribulation period saints? Are they church age saints? Are they, uh, are they is it all saints? Uh, and, you know, the text doesn't come right out and tell us, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that uh, 
based upon the 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 weight of Scripture, the analogy of Scripture, taking Scripture as a whole, uh, that since the Old Testament saints are not raised until after he returns, that's a good strong indication that we're there in the picture, the church. Uh, I don't hardly see how we can include the tribulation period saints or the Old Testament saints. So it's either, in my opinion, it's either uh, the angels as well as the church, or it's one or the other, or, you know, or both. And um, I, th I personally believe that it's both. Uh, and the reason for that is is because angels. There are other texts that seem to indicate strongly that that the angels of God, the elect angels, accompany him when he returns. But we are also said to accompany him that even paul said that that in regard to the rapture that when when the rapture occurs that and when he when he returned at the rapture that he would bring with him those who had fallen asleep well uh, and then we have the word follow to to think about i guess i'm going around the mountain to say here folks that we follow our shepherd. Where he goes, we go. If he returns, uh, or since he returns, at the rapture to remove his church, those who are asleep in Christ must, in my opinion, return with him. Now that gets into the whole you know, time versus eternity subject again. Or that you know, I believe that our death is is the rapture. We're propelled. We are propelled forward into the future to the day of the rapture, uh, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't know anything when we're asleep. We're unconscious, just like when we go to bed, and we we don't often get a a solid good night's sleep. But when we do, we don't know anything. All that that time is eclipsed. And so we're not asleep. You know, saints that have, that have died are not asleep from their standpoint, in their experience. In their experience, they're with him. But from the standpoint of those who, whom they left behind, the living, they are sleeping. So if I go to the cemetery and I stand over a grave of, of a loved one who's passed on that I know is with the Lord, they're asleep, not in their experience, but in mine. But my point being is, is that we follow him. We follow him. Uh, I, th I think, I guess, and I'm not, I don't really mean to push the text or uh, really, really push the text. I hope I'm not pushing it too far by suggesting that there's a reason why the Holy Spirit intended to convey the thought that we followed him upon white horses. He could have said that we just accompanied him upon white horses. But that's not the word that he used. And, and this, is, this is what I've stressed over and over again with you, with you folks. If we take the time to just stop, go a little slower, think about these words. This is the word of God, of our God. Uh, we tend to often just brush over, uh, hurry over, and sometimes even jump over, like, like a hurdle, some words because we just, well, it, I, I just kind of know what that means, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about that because it's just so obvious. Well, sometimes, folks, it may not be so obvious, or there may be something under the surface that we can uh, glean from that word or that phrase. We follow him. I think that's a marvelous, marvelous statement because that's exactly what we do is we follow him. Okay? We don't follow another. He's our shepherd. And we follow him upon white 
horses, white, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Man, that's pretty, that's pretty white. That's blinding. Now, you folks know, you know that I love horses. I've never owned a white horse. If that is literal, then that excites me to no end. Of course, I'd be just as happy uh, returning on a on a on a on a pale horse, or a, a, a roan horse, a dun horse, a, a blue horse. I I don't really care what color it is, to be honest. But the, but the fact of the matter is that. It is white. Now, it's easy for us folks to understand why the text says that we are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And of course, again, you can say, well, this, is all, this only refers to the angels. We're not returning with him. So these are the angels clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I have a little bit of a problem with that. If you don't have a problem with that, that's fine. But it, it's easy to understand what that's talking about. We are, we've been clothed with Christ. We stand in the righteousness of God. We stand before God clothed in the very righteousness of God himself. A truth that, that so many Christians need to understand. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Washed as white, whiter than snow. Not as white as snow, whiter than snow. Our sins cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea, remembered no more. We stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So I can understand that. But why white horses? Why is a horse got to be white? I'm not sure I really have any solid uh, thoughts on that, except to say that God is really pushing, pushing, pushing the whole idea upon us, impressing upon us, so that it weights us down. I mean, in a good way, it weights us down like like a like a. I don't know, just presses upon us so heavy the fact that there's a lot of purity related to what's going on here. Now, is that, the question is, is that something that is, that's, well, that's just someday. Well, I just hope someday I'm going to be, you know, I just look forward to the day that I'll be righteous, or I look forward to the day that I'll be you know, I know I look at my life today and it's it don't look so fine and so clean. My question to you, dearly beloved, is do you see yourself today as who God says that you are right here in this text? Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Following him. Well, does the old man follow him? Of course not. Does the new man Always, always does. While you're focused on the old man not following him, which he never will, you're missing, I think, seeing the new man in you that does follow him when he does. I could probably, you know what, I could probably never say that again for the rest of my life. But it's true, dearly beloved, you stand before him holy, righteous, just as righteous, God sees you. Dearly beloved, our Heavenly Father looks upon you and sees you as righteous as His Son. Can I just pause for effect here? Do you understand that? Do you understand that when God looks upon you, he sees you as righteous as his own son. Not because you somehow attain to some righteous standing on your own. 
but because you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, how do you think that that will affect your life, your walk, your talk, your conversation? What effect do you think that that truth, that just one truth alone would have, should have on your life? I can tell you for a fact, it's a game changer. It's a life changer. If you're struggling, if you're fearful, if you're afraid, if you're troubled, if you're hurt, if you're despondent, if you're crying, if you're lonely, if you're... I, I, let's just go through all the adjectives and, and just wrap up all of those adjectives into one thought. You're, you're, you're in despair. You're despondent. Well, first of all, God has you right there for a purpose. He's not, he's certainly not unaware of it. In fact, I'll go as far as to, as to state, uh, with great conviction, that he's designed those circumstances in your life. I don't know what he's taking you through in your life, dearly beloved. But what I do know, is that nothing touches your life except he, he never puts a hand on you except in love. Everything that you go through comes from his loving hand. But I personally think that it, it is, an, is a natural expression of the new man Okay, to just simply do what the new man does. Trust God, rest in his perfect finished work as it's been applied to your life. All the old man can do is, is all of that junk, worry, fear, just, I mean, you name it, anything negative. And out of his mouth, go with a sharp sword. That's quite a picture. You know, I was, oh, these artists love to get graphic about stuff like that. You know, you see a picture of Jesus and he's on a, he's maybe he's on a white horse and here he, he's, he's got a, the artist has a sword coming out of his mouth. You know, uh, we know what the sword represents. The sword represents the word of God. And I find it, without going into, you know, I really was trying to, I was hoping not to even mention the word Islam in this video, but they have, one, their, one of their major symbols is a crossed sword. And I just find, I'm sorry, I just can't help but find it interesting that out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, and that being the word of God, not the word of someone else. That with it he should smite the nations, the nations, and he shall rule. Rule. That that word "rule" in the Greek is the word "shepherd." We tend to look, read the word "rule" and and we think of, well, maybe maybe we think unintentionally, you know, think of you know rulers today and how they rule, and you know, well, Jesus Christ, he's coming and he deserves to he. This is going to be a theocracy, so he deserves to return and, and be that, that one ruler because he's king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to rule. He's going to dictate. You know, he's going to rule. He's, it's shepherd. The word is shepherd. And I love that. He'll shepherd them with a rod. Why does it say rod? Well, the, the, the word denotes uh, the, uh, the authority. He'll, so he'll shepherd them with authority. It's a rod of iron. Well, why iron? Well, it's iron. What do you think of when you think of iron? You think of strength. So he shepherds them with uh, the authority of his strength. You, you could say that. I think that's a great way to, to translate that. And he treadeth the wine 
press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He treadeth. Does it say we treadeth? Does it? He treadeth. Don't miss the personal pronouns, folks. He, we, they, you know. And especially when it, oftentimes when it, we see that it'll change, where it's real obvious, but, but personal pronouns, uh, are, we don't want to miss these. He treads. We don't tread. I think there's a, a clear indication there in the text that he's making war. We're not. He's warning the most powerful to submit or fall before him. I have trodden the wine press alone, he says, okay, and of the people there was none with me. Now, will we accompany him? I believe we will. And I believe that we'll be witnesses of his victory. To, to participate, okay, in the joy of the triumph. Listen, folks, that's what we do, okay? We don't share in his work. It's, it's not to engage in the work of warfare any more than we shared in the work of Christ as it concerned our redemption. Okay? We did nothing, nothing, nothing to be redeemed. Also a... a an absolute fact, true fact, that Christians have a hard time wrapping their minds around. He doesn't need our help, folks. He didn't need the help uh, of, of saving the ark from, from tipping over, okay? Uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Uzziah some, tried to help God as an example. I, I guess I'm a little stuck right here because it's my mind just goes all over the place when we get to talking about how the God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need your help, okay, in doing anything. It is, it is not uh, us doing for God helping God. That is not the Christian life. Now that may be the description, that may be what you read in the, in the description box or on the church bulletin board or in the church pamphlet, okay, that they print on Sunday. That may be the collective opinion of most much of modern Christianity today, but folks, that is not the fact, okay? of the matter. The fact of the matter is, is that anytime we come anywhere near to touching upon the work of God in the sense that we we well, God God needs our help. He can't do it without us. He did his part, now we got to do ours. I, there's a severe penalty attached to it. It is so sacred what he did. He won't share his glory with anyone, folks. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and, and wrath of Almighty God. He does that on his own. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh. On his vesture and on his thigh. The name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his thigh. I looked at that word, Mehron. I, you know, the, the first thing that drew me to, to the original text on that was I, I, thigh. Why thigh? Why, why, why doesn't the text say, and he hath on his vesture a name written? It says a vesture on his vesture and on his thigh. And why thigh? Why thigh? 
Well, I, I suppose you could just simply say when you, you know, you got your leg over, you know, your, your legs over. When you're sitting bareback on a horse, I, not, I doubt there'll be any saddles involved in any of this. Uh, what is what is it they see? They, they see your thigh. Obvious to all that, that every observer on his thigh. But the word meron in the Greek for thigh, it's the only occurrence of that word anywhere in all the Bible. Okay? One occurrence, that's it. One occurrence. On his thigh, the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And folks, there is no other God but our God. There's no other occurrence of that word thigh, and there's no other God but our God. There is no other God but our God. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and the sun, not standing near the sun, not st standing in the sun. Now, I, I, I can't tell you how to take that. I, I, you know, t to me, he's standing out so as to be clearly visible. This is kind of the way I would, I would, I would read that. Standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, saying to, to all the fowls, not, not to all the people, but to the fowls. So this is exclusively for them. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. And, and we just got through looking at uh, the, the, the wedding supper, the wedding banquet, the wedding feast, how, however you want to interpret that word. So now here we have another a contrast. We have the... the opposite side the, the reverse of the flip of you know flip over this is the supper of the great god it's not our supper with god it's the supper of the great god and i want you to notice it's the supper of the great it's what he god himself it's his supper okay oh but wait a minute i thought it said that it's to all the fowls that fly in the midst come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great god well, he's inviting them to the supper. Now, I'm not trying to in it, by any means suggest that God participates in that supper in the sense that he, well, you know, eats the flesh of kings. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that at all. But it does say it's his supper. You can't ex escape the fact that it says it's unto the supper of the great God. And it is uh, so... Listen, when we look back, we think back on the, on the, the, the wedding banquet. I, I covered this in the last video. I told you what I believed, and that is, is that the, the kingdom age, the millennial age, is a parabolic picture of that wedding banquet. Or the wedding banquet is a parabolic picture of the kingdom age. I believe that is absolutely correct. Some are invited to the kingdom. That's through the gospel of the kingdom that's preached during the tribulation period. Some reject, some accept, some reject. Those who accept enter into the kingdom. Those who reject do not. And it's where Christ introduces his bride, that is the church, to his friends, Israel. Parabolic picture of the entire millennial age. The word millennial, which look. The word itself means a thousand, a thousand years. So that's what we're looking at. And now we're looking at the supper of the great God. We're looking at another feast, another banquet. Now you, you could just simply, you know, take that as well. It's a, they're the cleanup crew, you know, kind of like, you know, the carrying, you know, the, clean up the road, the road kill. Uh, you don't have too many people going around, uh, cleaning up highways of roadkill because, you know, God's taking care of that with himself with the foul of the air. You could simply look at it like, as that. I think there's something much more deeper in, in that whole idea, that whole concept of that is, is that because 
they are being feasted upon. In contrast, the, the wedding feast of the Lamb and a feast by the fowl of the air on those seduced by the great harlot. Uh, it's interesting. I, you know, Again, I'm trying not to bring Islam into this. It's hard for me not to. It's, this is my interpretation. It may not be yours. They play a significant role. They're... They're, they're heavily involved in this scene. So in contrast, you've got the wedding of the lamb, and then you've got a, a feast by the fowl of the air on, on those that, uh, that were seduced. Uh, you got the, that major symbol of Islam, which is the cross swords. You've got God destroying them with the sword of his mouth. you got these contrasts. You know, the sword of his mouth being the word of God. Islam insists upon a quick burial. They, that's one of their customs. Well, their bodies will lie unburied for quite some time. They actually forbid cremation. Cremation. If you're if you're a Muslim, you that's that's forbidden. You know they forbid the burning of the body. Well, when gathered by the angels, the non-elect are cast alive into the lake of fire. And it, it it also they all Islam also forbids the, the eating of carrion, and so we here we have the carrion eating them, if if you take and include them as the enemies of God, which I do. So we're looking at him returning in judgment to establish his kingdom, his kingdom. So I want to spend a little bit of time, just a little bit, at least talking about something that I think is extremely important in our understanding anything and everything when we study, okay? A lot of people just don't know how to study. If they just understood some, some of the basic principles of how to go about studying, and there, I know there's various aspects, but, but one of the most important is rightly dividing between the two major dispensations that is Israel and the church okay the church is not Israel Israel is not the church never will be and and there's also an understanding a need to understand the, uh a rightly dividing between two principles which are law and grace which you also see that's it's connected interrelated to the subject of Israel and the church Israel law church grace so there's two principles law and grace and and by doing that folks we're learning how to study which results in spiritual growth which provides Deliverance, comfort, peace, joy, assurance, and rest, you know, for not just us, not but for both ourselves as well as others. And failure to rightly divide, make these distinctions, draw these distinctions between Israel and the church and, and law and grace. If we fail to do that, it results in stagnant growth. It results in the old man continuing to be uh, dominant in our lives. It, it contributes to a, a troubled and confused spirit. It, 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 it leads to ins insecurity, okay? And wasteful labor. I mean, you know, you're laboring in vain. Okay? You can spend your whole life in this book laboring in vain by not rightly dividing between these two major dispensations. If you confuse the church with Israel, you try to if you try to look at the teaching concerning Israel, God's dealings with Israel, and you try to, to there's, it's not that there's not application that can't be made there for the church, just as there's not application in church teaching and Paul's epistles or whatever that's not applicable in some way to Israel. But we're looking at two entirely different dispensations. That is, 
And when I use the word dispensation, I'm talking about simply talking about how God deals with his people at any given period, any given time. We know that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. That's John 1, 1, 1. 1, chapter 1, verse 11, John 1, 11, three ones. 1, 1, 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came unto his people that he hoped that would be his own if they received him. That's not what the text says. It, sa it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. That's what the text says. Our Lord said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Not come to be my people. Okay? He came. These were his people, folks, is my point. Come unto me. Well, the only ones that can come unto him are those the Father gave him. They're the only ones who will come. He's inviting those who are his people to come unto him, that all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Redemption? No. I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Not come to be my people. Only his people can come. No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father, John 6, 65. And Arminians hate that verse. They hate that verse because it doesn't fit their narrative. Because they say that, that we, we won't be given unto him of, of the father unless we come unto it. They reverse it. Okay. They flip it around. We're told in Hebrews 4.11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any, any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What same example? The example of Israel. Okay? They were his people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Are you getting this? Matthew one twenty one, and she and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew one twenty one, he shall redeem his people from their sins. No, he's already redeemed them; they're his people. Okay, and again, I, and I made a number of videos on redemption and salvation are not synonymous terms; they can be used interchangeably. But be careful when you come across the word saved. The word saved is sozo in the Greek. The word means delivered. Okay? We are redeemed in order to be delivered. That is saved. And you have Matthew one twenty one saying, He shall save His people from their sins. Deliver them from their sins. That is delivered from sin. We understood this when we went through Romans, that, that whatever, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What is sin? If you go around asking Christians, what, what is sin? What's sin? What is sin? Well, they can, they can go down a, <clears throat> a long list. Any one of us can make a long list on what we think sin is. Personally, I think if we did that, the list would go on forever. We couldn't exhaust such a list. There's not enough paper, okay, in the world to write all that down. Scripture says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It, it's it, He's taken it out of the realm of doing, whereas, you know, we're looking at sin as, some, uh, as an act, something we do. Folks, I, I've always believed that you, I, I could be sitting here just with my arms folded, just staring into outer space, doing nothing, not even moving a muscle, and I can be sinning. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Not trusting God is sin. Do you want to sin? All you got to do is, is, is don't exercise faith in God. Don't trust him. 
we know from our study in Romans that all righteousness is of the Lord. It's a righteousness that's based on faith. Paul says that he expressed his desire in Philippians that he might be found in him not having his own righteousness, but which, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The, the faith of Christ. That's the faithfulness of Christ, that he's faithful. The righteousness which is of God by faith. And so I'm trying to get around to the kingdom here. I know I've really rabbit trailed, but... Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he did. Okay, now we're looking at our text here. The kingdom age is about to begin. He's come. He's judged in righteousness and justice. He, he defeats his enemies. The kingdom is about to, to begin. In our study in Revelation, we're about to see that glorious kingdom appear. We go back to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, his people. He came unto his own, his own received him not, and preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom, the very thing that we're looking at here in our study. Okay? Was there a Christian alive in Matthew 4.23 when Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom that we're looking at here in our present study. Was there a Christian alive? No, there was not. Nope. Not a one. I'll tell you what I find remarkable. I don't find it remarkable that there was not a Christian alive at that point. What I find remarkable is that so many Christians today have trouble believing that there was not a Christian alive at that point. What is so difficult to understand about the fact that the church did not begin until Pentecost? Come back to Paul's epistles, Romans 9, 25, as he, as he also says in Hosea, I will call that which is not my people, my people and her not having been loved, having been loved, that's you and me. That's you and me. What happened when Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and come, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, preaching the gospel of the kingdom? What happened? Well, we know what happened. They rejected both the king, their king, their promised Messiah, as well as his offer for the kingdom. Okay? And we know that this was all ordained by God, arranged. It was all part of his plan so that salvation could come to the Gentiles, that's you and me, Gentiles as, is, as in all other nations besides Israel. The church was a mystery. The church was a mystery. The church has not replaced Israel, okay? And I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I want to get to the, to the fact that the, the gospel that Paul preached, which is the gospel by uh, which we believe, is not the gospel that Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in the synagogues. It was the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, the kingdom, okay? Which their long anticipated kingdom. Our, their, their idea, folks, was okay, you, it, have, you, have you, is it time? Is it, are you going to usher in that kingdom that we've so long awaited for? And of course, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons of that so when they came together they asked him lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel and jesus replied it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority you have to draw a distinction between god's program for israel and his program for the church we at the, in what is it March 15th, 2021. 
God is dealing with his church. He's not dealing with Israel. He set Israel aside in unbelief. The message that 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 of the gospel that we received through Paul. Did James and Peter preach that same gospel? Well, of course they did. They God had messengers that he sent to both Jews and Gentiles, but it was the same message. The same message. You won't hear um, anyone preaching the gospel of the kingdom until the two witnesses arrive on the scene. Until then, it's the gospel of grace. And there's a danger of mixing law and grace in into our theology. If we keep separate God's distinctive plan for Israel as well as the church, two, these two entirely different dispensations, then we, we keep separate. We don't mix oil and water together because they don't mix. Grace and law don't mix. The word kingdom, or uh, kingdom of God, kingdom of the heavens, etc. You'll read that in various forms. It's always determined by the context. The terms aren't synonymous, but they're often interchangeable. And uh, I wanted to get to uh, some of the distinctions between Israel and the church. There's many. Oh, I'm going to have to do that in the next video. I've got to uh, cut this off right here. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you're all well. Thank you for all of your messages, your kind messages of, of love and support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.